Once a week, we do Chaitanya Charitamrita. And, uh, there are two scriptures that are glorified and read regularly by the Gaudiya Vaishnavas, and that is Srimad Bhagavatam and Chaitanya Charitamrita. In fact, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati has made a pretty 
powerful statement. Whatever he speaks, he speaks something very revolutionary or powerful. He said, if you take all the books in the world and you throw them in the ocean, no, no, if you take all the books of the world and you burn them, and you only have Chaitanya Charitamrita left, there's no loss. <laughs> and Bhakti Vinod Thakur has said the same thing in reference to Srimad Bhagavatam, except he said, throw them in the ocean. So. so we see that if devotees really want to understand what is this philosophy and the essence and the ex explanations of the essence, these two scriptures remain prominent. Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita and Srimad Bhagavatam. So we should read these regularly, hear them regularly. Uh, they're non-different. Lord Chaitanya is non-different. Just like we stand in front of the deity every day and we take darshan of Lord Chaitanya. So in the same way, we are actually in front of Lord Chaitanya when we are in reading Srimad Ch Chaitanya Charitamrita. And Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati said, someday the whole world will then learn Bengali so they could read Chaitanya Charitamrita. Of course, now Prabhupada made it easy. <laughs> he translated it for us. <laughs> but yeah, so this is, this is non-different than Lord Chaitanya. And Srimad Bhagavatam, it's also mentioned in the Bhagavatam, that when Krishna left the planet, he left himself in the form of Srimad Bhagavatam. So those who worship Bhagavatam, read Bhagavatam, hear Bhagavatam, Nasta Prayesha Apardesha, Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya, Bhagavati Uttama Sloke Bhakti Bhavati Naistiki. So regular hearing of Srimad Bhagavatam is one of the prominent regulative principles, foremost regulative principles for the devotees. So, Srimad Bhagavatam Chaitanya Charitamrita. And Bhakti Siddhanta said something really interesting. He said, if you, you should approach Srimad Chaitanya Charitamrita before you read Srimad Bhagavatam. Because Chaitanya Charitamrita, and you read, if you see actually the, how the text is given to us, what is the first thing we read when we open Srimad Bhagavatam? Not before that. <laughs> before that. <laughs> there is a long explanation, 60 pages of the life of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, which Prabhupada put at the very beginning of the Srimad Bhagavatam. So he's giving us an indication. So Bhagavatam is the life of the Lord. You know, and the, it's, it's the living Lord in the form of literary uh, expression. So Chaitanya Charitamrita is living Bhagavatam, <laughs> living Bhagavatam. So devotees should read these books regularly, hear them regularly, and you distribute them also. Jaya Jaya Sri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Jaya Sri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Gaur Bhakta Vrinda So this is uh, about two weeks ago I did the uh, first fifth, 13 verses of this chapter so this is a continuation of the chapter, Life's Ultimate Goal, starting with verse 14 and 15. Adao strada tata sadhu Sanguta bhajana kriya Tato narta nivrittim sha Tato nishta ruchis tata Ata shakti stato bhavas Tata prema bhayan bhava Tato prema bhyandanchati 
Tato preman byu dan chiti. Well, you put it up on the board so you can see it. <laughs> it's the second. Oh, well, who's, who's working the. Oh, our. Yeah, there you go. Sadakanam mayo premna. Pradu bave bavit kramaha. We have to use, we have to say both verses because if you don't, it's just not. It's just like, it's like half a hen, you know. Adal strada tata sadhu. Sangota bhajana kriya. Tato narta nivriti shat. Tato nishta ruchis tata. Ata shaktis tato bhavas. Tata prema buddhanchati Sarakanam mayam prena Pradubhave bhavet kramaha This is quite long here. Adao, in the beginning, Stradha, firm faith or disinterest in material affairs and interest in spiritual advancement. Tata, thereafter, Sadhu Sangha, association with pure devotees. Tata, then, Bhajana Kriya, performance of devotional service to Krishna, surrendering to the spiritual master, and being encouraged by the association of devotees, so that initiation takes place. Tata, thereafter, and Artha Nirvriti, the diminishing of all unwanted habits, <coughs> syat, there should be, tata, then, nishta, firm faith, ruchi, taste, 
Tata, thereafter. Atta, then. Ashakti, attachment. Tata, then. Bhava, emotion or affection. Tata, thereafter. Prema, love of God. Abundanchiti, arises. Sadhukanam, of the devotees practicing Krishna consciousness. Ayam, this. Premna, of love of Godhead. Padur Bhave, in the appearance. Bhavet, is. Kramaha, the chronological order. So what you're about to hear is Rupa Goswami's explanation of what are the nine stages of bhakti. So if someone asks you, well, what does bhakti consist of? You tell them these nine stages. Okay, this verse is fundamental to understanding how Krishna consciousness is organized and how it works. In the beginning, there must be faith then one becomes interested in associating with pure devotees. Then one is initiated by the spiritual master and executes the regulative principles under his order. Thus, one is free from all unwanted habits and becomes firmly fixed in devotional service. Thereafter, one develops taste and attachment. This is the way of sadhana bhakti, the execution of devotional, score, of devotional service according to the regulative principles. Gradually, emotions intensify, and finally there is an awakening of love. This is the gradual development of love of God for the devotees interested in Krishna consciousness. Okay, so these nine, uh, uh, nine stages of bhakti. I could go on, but this verse is so fundamental, and I'm going to speak a little bit about that, although there is no purport. But I'll read this next verse also because this verse is also a powerful verse from Srimad Bhagavatam. Satang prasangam mamavirya sambhido bhavandri ritkarna rasayana katam najo sanad asvabhavarga vartmanim strada ratir bhakti anukramishyati. The spiritually powerful message of Godhead can be properly discussed only in the society of devotees and is greatly pleasing to hear in that association. If one hears from devotees, the way of transcendental experience quickly opens, and gradually one attains firm faith that it in due course develops into attraction and devotion. So this is also patterns the previous verse by kind of giving a succinct understanding of the process. Om Gyan Timirandasya Gina Jana Salakaya Chaksu Un Militamina Tasman Shri Guravena Mahashvila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So as we mentioned, these are the these are nine stages. So sometimes looking at this verse you can't disseminate or let me say uh, clearly, you know, see the nine stages. We can explain them in a very simplified way. When you first come, you know, you have a little faith. Well, who are these Hare Krishnas? Uh, they seem to have something interesting. Or maybe you just came just to check it out and see what's happening. So you have a little faith. There's something there that's worth looking into. So you come and you associate with the devotees. And then you're there and the kirtans are going on. You get prashadam. And you start meeting some nice people. They're really nice people. And they're friendly to you and they welcome you and they're trying to help you understand what's, what is uh, what is about. So you start developing a little faith and you, again, after that, Sadhu Sangha. Wow, this is nice. When's the next time you guys meet? So then you come back for that meeting and then you're there for, maybe you come to the morning program or you come to the evening program or Sunday feast. In other words, you start looking for that association again. And what they're doing is nice. I remember when I used to go to the New York temple when I first started in Brooklyn, Henry Street. 
the only the thing that was very outstanding was the smell of raspberry incense. <laughs> or was it strawberry? I'm not sure. <laughs> was strawberry or raspberry? It was it was like a trademark for the Hare Krishna temple. <laughs> strawberry smelling, raspberry smelling incense. It was so prominent that this was the smell of the temple. <laughs> that was so, it was so strong. And so it was pleasant, it was very pleasant. And then when you, when you would you come into that smell, you knew I was with the Hare Krishna. So, <laughs> so yeah, we'd, 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 and then we'd come, and then we'd hear that we'd sit in the program and then we'd, you know, get inspired to chant, and then somebody would encourage us to read the books, and we start reading the books, and we start liking what's going on, the association. It looks so fantastic, something that you never came in contact in your existence before. It's like wonderful in all ways. The food is so wonderful. The devotees are so friendly. The smells of the temple is so nice. And the altar, you look at it and you just get dazzled by colors. And you just think, whoa, wow, it's so beautiful and so colorful. I can't see anything. It just looks like a bunch of colors. <laughs> Sometimes the lights are so bright, you can't see anything. <laughs> so, you know, you start to get attracted to the whole pr program that's being presented before you. And then you start chanting, you start reading, you start association, and then you start becoming regular. And then after some time, you think, well, where do I go from here? And then someone says, well, you know, if you want to be a member, you have to be initiated. <laughs> no, eventually. And what does that mean? Well, there's a person whose name is a guru, he's a guru. And uh, he, he gives initiation, and you get a new name. And everybody has the same last name, Das or Dasi. <laughs> so you're either a Das or a Dasi, that's all. <laughs> and you get a new name, and the name is either a name for Krishna, a name for one of the incarnations of Krishna, a name of a holy place, or a name, you know, something. I remember in New Vrindavan, we gave cra pretty crazy names to some people. One person we gave the name, we gave a, a little girl's name, Jalebi. You know what a Jalebi is, right? It's something you eat. <laughs> we gave another name, one person got named Kitri, and that was, that was a little interesting. Because his father performed Chaturmasya, and for the whole four months he ate only Kitri with one hand behind his back and going down the whole process. At the end of four months he got married, and then um, his first child they named it Kitri. So, <laughs> so <laughs> little, it wasn't the standard around Iskand, it was just Nuvrindavan. <laughs> There was two movements. It was one is Iskan and one is New Vrindavan. So, <laughs> those. Tell one more antidote. <laughs> there was one devotee, he was making these kind of sweet balls, which were called, uh, what were they called? Um, uh, no, that was another one. Uh, yogi bars. Now he was making candy bars, yogi bars. So the temple authority, and he had his second child. So he named the second child Ananta, because Ananta also means finish, no more. <laughs> Conclusion, you know. <laughs> so he was trying to tell him, that's the last kid. <laughs> so he, he should only have two. He had a girl and he had a boy, Ananta. But then he had decided to have another child, which was against the instructions. <laughs> and the child was a boy. And he was selling these yogi bars, so they gave him the name Yogi Bar. <laughs> 
And the boy still, they still call him Yogi today. He's, you know, he's grown up, he's a man now. They call him Yogi. <laughs> so, anyway, so you get a name, and then you, get, you, know, you have a different name. You're always hoping, boy, I hope I get a nice name, not like, you know, Kitri Das or something like that. <laughs> or, 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 you know, like, what else could we, and I can't think of anything right now. <laughs> but anyway, you always want a nice name. I mean, and sometimes a disciple, uh, you know, a spiritual master asks you, what kind of name do you want? Do you want a name of Radharani if you're a girl, or do you want a name of Lakshmi, or do you want a name of, if you're a boy, you want a name of, like, Krishna or Lord Chaitanya or so. I've seen like that. I've even did that one time to one disciple. I said, um, do you want Ram Leela, Krishna Leela, or Gaur Leela? <laughs> and she said, Ram Leela. So I gave her the name Janaki Priya. <laughs> so like that. So yeah, so sometimes we, we offer our little choice because some people think, oh my God, what kind of name am I going to get? I just hope I get a so nice name that's so sweet that everyone chants it all the time and they can't forget it. <laughs> So, yeah, we, we really put a lot into that. <laughs> I mean, there's one story in the Srimad Chaitanya, no, it's in, it's in the Mahabhar, where the, uh, one of these sons of, um, when Santanu married Vegavati, he had two children, one was Pandu and the other one was Vichadavaria. Hmm? Yeah, be, yeah. Satyavati, that was his second wife. He married Ganga first. Hmm? Ganga was first. That was the first one he married. Satyavati came later. Because Bhishma asked. Yeah. And then uh, what happened was. Um, well, one of the one of the sons of the second marriage had another son, and his name was Chitrangada. So Chitrangada was also a name of a a, a Gandharva. Huh? Huh? He was a king of the Gandharvas. So he didn't like somebody else having his name, same name. So he challenged him to a fight. And he killed him. <laughs> the Gandharva won. <laughs> so sometimes you think, oh, God, I got the same name as that guy. <laughs> or that girl. <laughs> I want a unique name. <laughs> Something everybody remembers and chants nicely. Anyway, that's part of the process. You get a name, and then you also... Start chanting 16 rounds every day. You follow four negative principles. You remember those four negative principles? Who can, who can recite the four negative Maharaj, I know you know them. <laughs> no meat, fish, and eggs, and tea and coffee. That's the extra one. <laughs> who knows the four negative principles? Let's see, who can I pick on here? Who, who, okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. No illicit sex, no intoxication, no gambling, and no meeting, right? Okay. So I remember one, one devotee, he was giving his vows, and they asked him the four. He said, no intoxication, no gambling, no meeting, and no sex. <laughs> and he was young yet, so I was thinking, hmm. Does he really want to say that? <laughs> and then there was one lady, she was like, you know, she was like an Indian lady in her 60s. She had been through her whole life, very pious, religious, and she was saying, no illicit sex. I was thinking, <laughs> oh, God, this is that. <laughs> I was at the initiation, I was thinking, 
She said it so humbly, too. No illicit sex. I mean, she's like 65. She's got grown-up kids, you know. She's a pious Indian. <laughs> so, yeah, we, we, we vow to follow those four. And then we chant 16 rounds. And then we have a spiritual master. Now, under the guidance of the spiritual master, one works to understand how to overcome those things which are blocking our progress in Krishna consciousness. And they're called anarthas. Artha means something that's wanted. Anartha means unwanted. Jai pancha tattva ki jai. So there are 16 anarthas. Okay, I'm going to test you. There are four categories of four. Who knows the 16 anarthas? Because this is important. If you don't know what you got to get rid of, you may not be able to, you know, overcome something you're not aware of. <laughs> what are the 16 anarthas? There's four categories of four. The first category is philosophical misconceptions. The second one is pi an artist by pious activities, there's an artist by impious activities, and there's offenses. So each category has four an artist. So let me see who can understand. Name one category, and then name one thing in one of the categories. I'll make this class a little bit interactive, because we just want to involve all some of the devotees so they can think a little bit, instead of just listening to me all day. Okay, so what are the four? Come on. Does anybody know one of them? <laughs> I know, Maharaj, you know all 16. <laughs> but if you want to say one, you can. Well, under the uh, fences, the apparatus, mm -hmm. you have Seva apparatus. Seva apparatus. Dham apparatus. Which one? Dham. Dham? That's not mentioned by Bhakti Vinata Kaur. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. But the four mentioned by Bhakti Vinod Thakur in his uh, Bhajana Rahasya, and also he also mentions it in other writings, is offenses to the Lord, which means the deity, Seva Bharat, uh, offenses to the holy name, offenses to Vaishnavas, and offenses to people in general. These are the four he mentions like that. And then, of course, these other offenses are there too. But these are the four he gives as the four within that category. And what is the worst offense? No. Huh? No, no, no. no, no. Vaishnava Parad. Nama Parad can be overcome by chanting, 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 purifying your chanting and avoiding the offenses. Vaishnava Parad requires some... Um, effort to approach the person you have offended and make amends and also offer some service in return. If you offend a Vaishnava, you have to sincerely apologize, not what we say officially apologize. Sincerely apologize means because you cause some offense to someone, there's some disturbance on that person, to that person. So, it's not like, oh, I commit an offense, I disturb them, now I'm going to get a reaction, so I'm afraid of my reaction, therefore I'll, I'll, I'll make uh, amends for that. That's secondary. The, the idea is that we're actually sorry we caused someone some inconvenience or some, you know, offense. And that's the mood of apology, and then you offer, can I do some service for you? Please offer me, ask me to do anything and I'll be happy to do it. So that, that, that completes, and if that person is forgiving, and generally Vaishnavas are really, really forgiving, I hardly know any situation where anyone has refused to accept a person's apologies, although it has happened <laughs> a couple of times that I heard of. <clears throat> so, yeah, Vaishnava Parad is, uh, what we say, can, will check your advancement in spiritual life. So these are the four offenses in the uh, category of aparads. So what is the four impious activities? What are the four things that you could aspire for in a pious way that are considered blocks in one's devotional service? Who knows? 
People aspire for them, even in devotional service. But they're blocks. One is the desire to go to heavenly planets. Two, desire for mystic power. Three, the desire to enjoy this material nature. In other words, even outside of the four regulative principles, there's nice ways to enjoy the material energy. They're considered to be just ordinary sense gratification. And the last one is liberation, the desire for liberation, like that. Sahujya Mukti, generally. So these are the four pious anarthas. Now, does anybody know the impious anarthas? Um, well, these fall into categories of sinful activities. In other words, the four regative principles, breaking these things, or things that are sinful by, react, by nature, against all scriptural activities. Uh, duplicity, and what is that one? There's another one. Envy. envy is one by itself. Envy by itself, there's duplicity and uh, so I forgot the other one. Deceitful. Deceitful, yeah, that's it. Deceit and duplicity. And then um, what's the last one? Envy. Oh, yeah, pratishta. Pratishta is desire for material fame. <laughs> desire to become famous. Now, that's the toughest one out of the four, to be deep, because people want to be famous. <laughs> They chanted my glories. Whoa, that guy is nice. This guy doesn't know about my glories. And if he doesn't chant my glories, I'm not going to talk to him. <laughs> so, in other words, uh, this Bhakti Vinod Thakur and Srila Prabhupada also mentions that this is the, what we say, the last snare of Maya, that people want to be famous in whatever way they perform their activities. They want distinction, they want adoration, they want some profit from that. And that's an anartha. <laughs> that's an anartha. Devotees don't want anything but devotional service. They want to serve, they want to purify their heart, they want to inspire others in Krishna consciousness. So a devotee is humble, not looking for anything on a personal level, although Krishna may send these things Krishna does give position, he gives facilities, he also gives followers, he gives, you know, sometimes you can't have a follower, so you get married, so somebody follows you. you know. It happens like that. <laughs> what to do? <laughs> Nobody likes me, and I'll get married, and at least one person may like me for a little while, anyway. Something like that. So everybody wants recognition. It's so strong within the conditioned soul's nature. It's so deep. It's really deep. Mm. To get to get to want to get free from this desire for personal recognition is very very strong. And sometimes we see people who perform devotional service and make very nice advancement. This 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 pratishta, this desire for fame and distinction sometimes causes them to fall even in the later stages. We have one example where there was one very powerful preacher, I forgot his name, Rupa Raghunath or something, and he was known for his discourses on Shastra. He was expert, and when he would speak on the philosophy, many, many hundreds and hundreds of people would come to listen to him each time he spoke. So one time, one... Uh, great Vaishnavi, I think her name was Krishna Priya, she had come to listen to his discourse, but she had, the, uh, she had an attachment for chanting Hare Krishna, she couldn't stop. <laughs> so she's sitting in his class listening and she's chanting also. Now she's listening, but she's chanting the Hare and the Holy Name. And he notices it and he singles her out, oh, you think you're so advanced, you can chant Hare Krishna while you're sitting here listening? So he starts ridiculing her for chanting while he's speaking. She didn't say anything, she remained quiet. And later on, he fell. 
because he offended her. He was quite arrogant and angry the way he presented his criticism to her in public. Um, but she remained humble. And so later on he fell from his position. So there, there's an example of a person who's very high in spiritual practice but commits an offense like that. Because he's, he's famous and he thinks, oh, you know, someone else is acting and not recognizing my, my position. <laughs> yeah, so, like that. And then the last category is philosophical misconceptions. Actually, that's the first category. I said it last, but it's actually the first one. And that is not knowing the difference between the soul and the body. Not knowing the principles of bhakti. Uh, not knowing the process of sadhana bhakti and prema bhakti, what they make up. Um, What's the other one? Not knowing the position of Krishna. And the last one is not is bringing in principles that are contrary to Vaishnava philosophy and accepting them as part of Vaishnava philosophy. Sort of just like certain Mayavadi things that, you know. Like someone just wrote me a letter and they said, they quoted one verse that's quoted in, uh, I think, one of the Puranas that is ch chanted by the, the Maya bodies. Guru Krishna, Guru Shiva, Guru Brahma, Guru this, Guru, 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 Guru. Guru's got his feet all over the universe. <laughs> yeah. He quoted the verse and he wanted to give me some honor. <laughs> so I accepted it as dishonor. <laughs> so I wrote him back and I said, we do have a nice verse that you can chant. Uh, what is that verse in the, the, the Guru Vastakam prayers? The next to the last verse. Saksad hari twin So I mentioned that verse. I said, if you want to speak about the Guru, you can speak the guru, about the Guru in that, using that particular verse. And then I said, you know, this whole Guru Vastakam prayers is what we chant every day and it gives us an understanding of the activities and positions of the spiritual master and how to glorify him also. So I mentioned that. So yeah, so people bring in these, what we say, Mayavadi or what we say, uh, Sahaja tendencies into Krishna consciousness and that's an anartha. So these are the for misconceptions, philosophical misconceptions. So try to remember these 16 anarthas. They're mentioned in Bhajana Rahasya, if you can get that book by Bhakti Vinod Thakur. Or just look them up. You can do a little Googling on the four, uh, the four categories of anarthas. Because if you don't know them, and you don't know how to overcome them, you're, you really don't know where you are in Krishna consciousness and what is your next step in terms to make advancement. And then Bhakti Vinod Thakur explains. But he does, give, he does give one concession. It's not a concession, it's actually a fundamental principle. He says all anarthas are destroyed by Harinam Sankirtan. <laughs> so if you just do a lot of Harinam Sankirtan <laughs> and you're into it and you're absorbed into it, you, your anarthas are being destroyed fast. <laughs> So we can do that. But still, we want to understand what are the things that are holding us back in our spiritual process. And so from Anartha Nivritti comes Nishta, that means firm faith. Nishta is the, is the level of advancement where three quarters of the Anarthas are removed. You still, you still can make progress beyond the stage of Nishta even though there are still anarthas left. And then those anarthas are generally what offenses. Offenses carry all the way up to prema, love of God. Even on love of God, you can commit offense. Even on love, we have the example of Jaya and Vijaya. Of course, that was arranged by the Lord. But that's an example to understand that even on the highest platform, only when you see Krishna face to face 
then there's no chance of committing any offenses. And that's one of the stages of prema. So nishta is the next stage, and then ruchi, a sweet taste, and that's divided into two categories. Taste that comes by excellence of elements and taste that comes automatically by the activities of devotional service. In other words, if the kirtan is nice, then I get, I'm get i happy. But if it's not nice, it's not in sync, I don't get that higher taste. So one is excellence of elements, that everything has to be nice, and then the higher taste is there. But there's others who are on a higher taste, that wherever the chanting is, wherever the glorification is, they still glor they still they, they taste the sweetness of that glorification, although it may be improperly or has some flaws in the way it's presented. After them comes a shakti, that's attachment to Krishna, that one can and there's there's nine stages of the attachment. And then after that, you, the, one, of the, one of the nine stages of attachment in, in that stage category is not wanting to waste one moment without serving the Lord. That's one of the main characteristics in that, that, that to use every minute. And when a devotee feels that they have lo wasted some time, they feel bad. <laughs> they want to use every moment for Krishna consciousness. That's one of the symptoms of a, a shakti. And then after that, the next stage is bhava, that's natural, genuinely heartfelt affection for Krishna. And that there are symptoms that, ex that define these expressions. You actually feel love for Krishna. The emotions are actually, every time you see the Lord, you hear the Lord, or just thinking about the Lord, your heart melts in affection for the Lord. And there are also symptoms. And then the st next stage is when love actually appears. Affection concentrates into love. And on the stage of affection, there's six stages. On the stage of bhava, prema, there's nine stages. Eight stages, I'm sorry. Eight stages. So this is the science of bhakti. I gave a real, real quick uh, overview, synopsis of this because... We don't have the time. We can give us, you know, a week-long seminar on this whole verse. This is Rupa Goswami. So these are the nine stages. If we know those nine stages, study them, you can see where you are in Krishna consciousness. Generally, we're working with Anartha Nivriti. Some of us may be on the stage of Nishta. We're steady in our devotional service. Nothing's going to break our determination to engage in devotional service, no matter what happens. And then, and then, of course, then that sweet taste of Krishna consciousness develops as nishta becomes mature. But, you know, as Prabhupada and Rupa Goswami says, up to a shakti, that's sadhana bhakti. After a shakti, then, then bhava bhakti comes, and then prema bhakti, like that. So bhakti is divided into three categories, sadhana. And sadhana has two categories, vaidhi bhakti and raganuga bhakti. And Baba Bhakti has six categories that's mentioned, nectar of devotion. And Prema Bhakti has eight categories, all symptomized by certain characteristics that the, the, the devotee exhibits in their execution of love of God. This is a great science, this Krishna consciousness. It's a wonderful science. It's so deep. And it's, it's given to us by those who are actually experiencing these different levels. Who, who experience it and who are on the highest stage. So Srila Rupa Goswami is our uh, Abhideya Acharya. He teaches the process of bhakti. So um, this verse is very, very fundamental. So we'll stop here and see if there's any comments, questions. Yes, Mataji. I noticed when you chanted the verse, you were so enthusiastic. You must have some experience here. No, um, so, uh, for some of us, um, uh, being in Krishna consciousness uh, seems um, seems uh, kind of comfortable. Yeah. Um, associating with devotees, taking prasadam, offering some service, um, but. To, but how do we go to the next level? Do we do we just chant 
more nicely or do we read more, do we associate more, or do we need to address this anarta systematically? And well, you should understand what the anarthas is and try to avoid them. By avoiding the negative and emphasizing, as you said, chanting, reading, taking prasadam, associating, serving, then that, that moves us forward. But the anarthas will, will dilute the, the effects of our chanting and our Krishna consciousness unless we get rid of them. You'll get some benefit but and you see, devotees have been practicing for years and years, and they're not moving forward. Why? Because the anarchists are still there. <laughs> so yeah. So the positive is what we emphasize, and but the negative, we. And that's why uh, Sanatan Goswami explains uh, anukalena and pratikul, things to do and things to avoid. And you read that in Nectar Devotion also. So yeah, we have to be aware of these anarthas and how they're keeping us from moving forward in Krishna consciousness. But as Prabhupada said, you bring in the sun, the darkness goes. So you bring in the power of your Krishna consciousness, anarthas will gradually go. But then if you feed the anarthas, you give them attention, and you give them some energy, then they get stronger. And they get stronger. If you just forget about them and then emphasize Krishna consciousness, gradually they'll diminish. But every time they come and remind you, then you have to say no <laughs> or don't act on them like that. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Shri Chaitanya Charitamrati Ki Jai Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai Panchatattva Ki Jai